There we go. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, we'll probably get some more folks jumping on. I know we, we, <laughs> we had some issues with uh, the meeting calendar and all that kind of good stuff. And, and again, I guess I'm the only one that actually someone deleted the meeting and it, it canceled it on my calendar. I can't figure that out for the life of me. But, and it wasn't me. Was it you, Michael? Yeah, figures. Just down the street. Anyway, um, yeah, that's good seeing everybody. We're, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, what's first flow? The, uh, the EDA discussion, right? So one of our Jamies is going to have a conversation with you all about uh, <laughs> the latest offering. So go ahead, Jamie Hackbar. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me. I am going to go ahead and share my screen here. And you all disappear when I do so, so just shout um, if it's good to go or not. Can you see that? Looks good. There it okay, is. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so yes, Jamie Hackbarth, I am with the Economic Development Administration here with the Denver Regional Office. I am the Economic Development Representative for both Colorado and Utah. Um, and some of you may have worked with my colleague Trent Thompson in the past. Uh, there's two of us now. I am his partner in crime. And our job is to work with communities such as yourself of going after potential funding opportunities, thinking through ideas, if they'll work um, et cetera, whatever it looks like. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with the Economic Development Administration, um, one of our main kind of foundational priorities is really have, helping leverage that bottom up economic development. So you all know your communities best, you know, all, know what projects are needed, where are the biggest needs, um, and we try to work with you on which funding opportunity will match with that best. Um, our biggest thing in the past, I would say, is that connection to high-skilled, high-paid primary jobs. Um, with the new American Rescue Plan funds, there are some opportunities um, that are new that aren't as, uh, don't need as direct of an area with that. But we still say uh, the more jobs you're able to create, the more competitive, but there's some new exciting opportunities that we'll talk through today. So uh, the 3 billion American Rescue Plan funds, what I am here to talk about today. Um, this is rather historic for EDA, to put this in perspective for you. This is 10 times our annual national budget. Um, so huge dollars, as well as double the amount of what we received for our CARE stimulus package, was, which was about 1.5 billion. Really what we're looking at across the board here on the slide is what we're hoping to achieve with our funding opportunities. We really wanna look at jobs for today and tomorrow for the future of the workforce, building equitable communities for all. Um, equity is one of our investment priorities and as well as building resilient uh, regions for the future as we're recovering from and still unfortunately living, living within the coronavirus. Um, I did wanna caveat um, traditionally in the past, we have only been able to work with communities that reached a certain distress level based on unemployment and per capita income, which a lot of times actually uh, precluded us for working with the front range Dr. Cog communities. But a silver lining of all of this is the coronavirus pandemic declaration makes every community eligible for this funding now based on that pandemic. Um, so uh, you all are now able to think through projects and partner with us, but uh, that also means our funds are a lot more competitive to go after as well. So wanted to just give a quick overview of what our investment priorities are. Uh, these change with each uh, presidential administration, and these are President Biden's with the EDA. What these basically are, are our guidepost of, does your project fit into one or a couple of these areas? Um, in terms of equity, that's looking at serving historically underserved communities, uh, both racial, gender, economic, as well as geographic. Um, and then you, all, you could read through the list, I'm not gonna talk through them, um, but recovery and resilience, almost every, I think, project can touch on that related to especially recovery from the pandemic. Um, and then the others, workforce development, manufacturing, technology and environmentally based and exports and foreign direct investments. And if you do wanna learn more about them in detail, 
Um, the link is right there, eda.gov backslash about backslash investment priorities. And that's my job. If you do have a project in mind and we have follow-up conversations, we work with you on how to best showcase which investment priority you may um, fit into as well. So diving in into the nitty gritty of what the 3 billion looks like in Colorado. There is a lot going on on this slide. The yellow highlighted numbers is what is available for Colorado. Um, and I'll walk through that a little bit and then we're gonna actually dive in into each of these six funding opportunities and high level so you're aware of how they, they look like in more detail. So statewide planning, research, and networks, every state across the country received or was invited to receive 1 million of non-competitive funds. Colorado sent that invitation to the governor just a few weeks ago, and essentially they're working through how they will use that 1 million across their regions um, to basically invest in economic plans uh, for recovery. The Build Back Better Challenge, uh, this takes up a big chunk of that $3 billion. One billion of the $3 billion is going to the Build Back Better Challenge, uh, which we'll dive into detail as, a, as it's a funding opportunity that we have never seen before in the past um, and looking at really um, transformational uh, cluster projects and bringing together projects for um, basically leveraging emerging or existing economic industries within a region. Um, so we'll go into that in a bit more detail, but just know that's 1 billion of the 3 billion. Travel, tourism, and outdoor recreation uh, funding buckets. This we have not been able to fund before in the past. So this is completely new to EDA and very exciting. Similar to the statewide planning, um, each state received a certain amount of funding based on the job loss and GDP loss based on tourism decline last year. Colorado received an invitation to utilize about $9 million for that. Um, and they are uh, working through, same thing, invitation to the governor, working through what that's gonna look like across the state um, and hopefully serve the whole state as well as the front range. A bucket of that is competitive. So if you have regional projects that fit in travel, tourism, and outdoor recreation, you would wanna go after 19 million um, is available competitively across the Denver Regional Office, uh, which means you're competing across the 10 other applicants or applicants from the 10 other states within our regional office. Um, but it can fund a variety of things and we'll go into what that looks like too. Economic adjustment assistance. This is kind of our catch-all, more traditional uh, funding bucket, rather flexible, can fund everything from the brainchild of a project to operations, to infrastructure. Um, and that can fund, uh, within our regional office, we have 59 million available for competitive funds. And moving down, um, indigenous communities, these have to be um, applied for by a tribal nation itself or benefiting a tribal nation. We have 11 million available for that in the Denver regional office. If you by chance have partner organizations that you work for um, that benefit tribal nations as well. Um, and then our Good Jobs Challenge specifically focused on workforce development. This is a national competition um, and there is 500 million available for that uh, across the nation. And I'll dive into each of these a bit more in detail uh, going over what they look like. So statewide planning here, um, as mentioned, $1 million was given to Colorado. Um, and hopefully this will impact uh, the Dr. Cog communities as well. The other 31 million just wanted to make you all aware as you might have partners um, interested in this. It's really looking at more research and evaluation and bringing together coalitions of how one, we are kind of recovering from the coronavirus and also really kind of dive into that. The applicants for those are usually third party organizations, facilitators, foundations, that do those research um, basically criteria. So if you do have people in your network that um, or organizations that do that, that, that would be the funding bucket for them. It's usually not looked at that COGS um, or local communities go after that funding bucket. So the Build Back Better Challenge, uh, the big $1 billion funding opportunity, uh, this is really looking at building on the fundamentals of EDA's work. Um, really looking at leveraging our true core principles 
at supporting regional economic clusters across all industries and across the nation. Uh, so what does this mean? Um, it's really looking at bringing together regional coalitions. And that can mean regionally, such as Dr. Cog, that can mean statewide, that can mean across state lines, and that can mean nationally. Um, it's really looking at having these coalitions come together with one lead entity to basically coordinate three to eight transformational projects that will leverage a new or existing industry cluster. And you can kind of see some examples of those in the images on the right here. Um, and those projects can range. Those can be large scale infrastructure projects uh, that are creating jobs in the area. Those can be workforce development programs, entrepreneurship planning, and a mix and match of both, as long as it's changing the trajectory of a newer emerging industry cluster in your region. What this looks like is rather different than our other funding opportunities. It's broken up into two phases. Uh, phase one is what we're calling our technical assistance phase. Uh, the total maximum amount you can apply for is 500,000, and that is at 100% grant rate, meaning you would not need to provide a match. The deadline for this is this, the one most on the horizon. horizon. It is October 19th of this year. Um, so if you all are already thinking of going after this, we're really encouraging people to start getting their wheels turning and working with us on seeing if this is a good idea for you all to go about. The technical assistance phase is really meant to, for you all to come together as a coalition, um, whatever that might look like, whether that's multiple regions within Colorado, um, to really kind of build out these transformational proposals and polish them, prepare them and mature them so that you're ready to apply for phase two for the implementation grant. So an example of what that would look like is say, you do wanna apply for four transformational infrastructure projects across the line. Within this phase one period, you will utilize the funding to really dive into the environmental work, the preliminary engineering work, et cetera, that is needed to readily apply for phase two come March. Um, and just want to note, if you are awarded phase one, it is not guaranteed you will be awarded the phase two implementation dollars. Um, but there's, if that, I, the hopes are either way that whatever you do in phase one would be useful to go after potential other EDA funding opportunities. And the phase two amounts uh, can be 25 all the way up to $100 million to fund three to eight projects that you all identify. Um, and that one does have a match requirement. 80-20 um, is the match ratio on that, meaning a $10 project, you request eight from EDA and match, uh, or you match, request $8 from EDA and match $2. And I did wanna note here, there is $100 million set aside out of this 1 billion for projects uh, uh, basically responding to transition, the transition of coal economies as well. So moving on, I don't wanna take up too much time of your meeting, so I'll kind of speed through this and I have time for questions and discussion as time permits. But travel tourism and outdoor rec, as noted, there's two buckets, the state grants on the left, that is the 9 million that Colorado received. Um, and as noted, they're deliberating how they will utilize that from the menu of options that they can. So I did wanna note that bucket of money that's going towards the state can fund destination marketing money. So if that is something your communities wanna focus on, I would go to the state for that destination marketing funding because our competitive, what is called the challenge money on this slide um, cannot fund local destination marketing. marketing. Um, but that challenge money, um, 19 million regionally, um, that is what projects um, such projects basically responding to the impact of job loss or GDP and tourism related communities can apply for. Um, and that could be a wide range of projects as long as they're directly supporting those sectors or potentially diversifying away if it's a heavily reliant tourism community, uh, for example. Um, and as well, I do wanna note, um, we can now fund trails, um, which has not been allowable in the past. So economic adjustment assistance, this is um, our most familiar EDA funding opportunity that's being housed within the ARPA programs as well. 
It is our most flexible, as noted, there is 59 million available for this competitively for the Denver Regional Office. And I like to say, some of, of our catch-all, it can fund a wide range of programs. So if you have a project in mind that doesn't fit in the other funding buckets, but is a more, it most likely we would fit in this. We could fund the brainchilds of projects, such as a feasibility study, to operations of say an incubator, accelerator, or workforce development program, all the way to our large scale public works and infrastructure projects, as long as they are on publicly owned land and able to show there is a commitment from private industry to create X amount of jobs as a result of the project. Um, so that is high level overview of that. I mean, no, there's a lot more details to each of these, um, but just wanted to give you all the overview as you're potentially thinking of ideas. Indigenous communities, rather similar to the kind of portfolio that EAA, Economic Adjustment Assistance, what I just reviewed, can fund, um, but it can only, only um, yeah, tribal nations and indigenous communities can apply for this funding opportunity. Um, it is important to note, uh, this is a 100% grant match rate opportunity when the economic adjustment assistance and competitive travel tourism opportunity I just went over is that 80%, 20% grant, grant rate. Still, that is a higher grant rate than our normal um, average, which is about 50-50, um, depending on distress. And our last funding opportunity, the Good Jobs Challenge. This is a national competition, um, also 100% grant rates. Uh, the deadline for this is January 26, I believe, of this of 2021. And it's really looking at funding regional ecosystems that will elevate workforce development for in-demand skills. Um, and you could, looking at it across these three phases, we could fund system development from the ground up, uh, such as sector partnerships, as some of you may be familiar with, uh, program design for curriculum or expansion of curriculum, as well as program implementation. We can fund all these three phases at once, or we could fund one phase if say you're already done with system development and program design and need implementation funds. This challenge is really looking at focusing on underserved communities that have traditionally been overlooked within the workforce ecosystems. Um, so it is gonna be a competitive challenge. This is one of the few funding opportunities I can't provide direct assistance by reviewing your drafts, but I can answer questions um, and see if this is the right fit for what you all are thinking. Lastly, I wanted to note there are quite a bit of resources. I just kind of gave you uh, the skim of the top of all of these funding opportunities, but eda.gov backslash ARPA, there are one page overviews of all of these. There are notice of funding opportunities for each of them, which are wonderful 50 page bureaucratic documents if you really want to do your homework. Um, webinars are frequently asked questions. And as well, I wanna note myself and Trent, uh, our contact information is here. Uh, we say we are the personification of those lo um, long, uh, very long notice of funding opportunities to help you answer those questions, help you figure out which funding opportunity you would be most competitive for um, and all of the above throughout the application process to make this as transparent on your end as possible. Um, so that was, that is it. Um, really just kind of flew through that as fast as I can, but if there is time, I can open it up for questions um, or move on to the next item in the agenda and know that I am available um, via email to set up follow-up um, calls and meetings, et cetera. Well, thanks, Jamie. Maybe we should take um, a, a couple questions now uh, because I know Jamie Weiss' presentation may may open some questions about the applicability of, of EDA funding too. So uh, you all have the ability to unmute yourself um, and ask a question of Jamie Hackboy at EDA. I wanted to bring this to you because typically uh, the Dr. Cog region is not an EDD an economic development district and and uh, typically EDA funding is targeted at EDDs. But in this case, uh, because of the COVID funding ties to it, it is open to even those areas of Colorado that are not in an economic development district. So I wanted to make sure that you all were 
we're aware of that. Jamie, I do have one question, and, and that would be if there is a proposal that includes more than one community um, for any of those, would that be considered more competitive than a single single entity community? Yes, wonderful, wonderful question. And yes, regional approaches and economies are always more competitive than just a sole, um, say, town application. I um, mean, even if it is just, a, say, an infrastructure pro project in the town, showcasing how that will benefit the region and neighboring towns and counties um, is more competitive than just focusing on your own. And we highly recommend that as well and collaboration and showing that partnership. Okay, perfect. Well, you mean, remind me, oh. Yeah, remind oh. me the um, match requirement for the Build Back Better Regional Challenge first phase. There is no match requirement no for the first phase. First so that's yeah, 500,000 max. Um, and that's hoping, and then knowing for phase two, as you're working through your potential budget proposal, an 80 20 match ratio for when you're going to be applying for the phase two. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And wanted to know too, I don't think I touched on this for the other competitive economic adjustment assistance and travel competitive funds. Um, the deadlines for those are, we're, we're saying March 2022, we're recommending if you have project proposals to get started on those as soon as possible and recommending more kind of a January timeframe, just in case based on funding availability and such. And how about the deadline for the economic adjustment assistance? So, same thing for that. So okay. it's, they're saying Mar mid-March 2022. But as your economic development rep suggesting January at the at, to get in there while it's while we still have funds. Doug, did you have a question? Which Doug? You. Doug Rex or Doug DeBorg? <laughs> no, you. No, I didn't. Okay. Okay, if there's no, quest, uh, no further questions, Jamie is going to stick around with us for the next Jamie pre presentation. <laughs> so, as you know, we've been continuing to have the dialogue and work on homelessness as, as, as a regional issue, and, and Jamie's here to give us an update on, on um, her work with the sub-regional forums. So, Jamie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Flo, can you see that okay? Yes, it's good. Perfect. Um, so I just wanted to come today and talk a little bit about some exciting updates with the Built for Zero um, and Regional Homeless Coordination that we've been talking about um, in this group. So just as kind of a refresher, um, what we did is we stood up nine sub-regions to kind of work on this coordination with homelessness. The seven counties, the tri-cities, which is um, Inglewood, Sheridan, and Littleton, as well as Aurora. And so on March 18th, we had the regional convening where we had everyone come together and kind of kick off this process. And so today I just wanna talk a little bit about the progress um, and just share really some exciting news with all of you. So as you'll remember, we set up um, a very similar structure to what our region does for transportation. Um, so we have what are the homeless coordination teams in each of those nine subregions. So those are like your outreach workers, your providers, veteran services, as well as some staff from MDHI. And then in each of your communities, there's actually a community lead who has been identified and will serve on the homeless coordination team. The other side of that is um, kind of the sub-regional form and tax side, which all of you are very familiar with. Um, and that's where I'll be talking a little bit about what that looks like in each of the, the nine sub-regions and, and kind of progress on what we've done so far with that. So just so all of you know, these are the community leads. So those are the people in your community that are kind of leading this work um, to help stand up the homeless coordination teams, as well as work with MDHI and community solutions on the homeless coordinate or on the sub-regional forums and the technical advisory committees as well. So kind of digging into where we are in each of the sub-regions. So it's really exciting because about 
eight weeks ago, this was much more blank than it is today. Um, you can see that we've identified that community lead in each of the subregions. We have formed homeless coordination teams in each of the subregions. Um, Arapahoe is still in progress and Douglas is in progress, but they're starting to identify who and what um, organizational kind of structure that's already in place will serve as the homeless coordination teams. The next step is really kind of the important one, and that's where the communities will be sitting down and going through what the built, what's called the Built for Zero scorecard. And that is a series of, um, I think it's about 27 different metrics or questions that um, communities need to say yes to. And once they are able to say yes to all of those things, they have what is called, um, they have good data. So it might be like, do you have full outreach? Do you have access points in your community to get into HMIS? Do you have um, a process to match people to housing? All of that. And so once a community can answer yes to all of those, you'll hear that that community has quality data. And that's a really big stepping stone in this process. So what communities are doing right now is seeing which of those metrics they can answer yes to, which of those are a no in their community, and starting to work to get those no's to yeses. And then what we've been able to do, which is really exciting, is create a veteran by name list. So that's what that BNL stands for. So that's literally knowing by name, A, how many veterans are in the entire region, and then how many veterans are in your subregion. So your um, Aurora, your Tri-Cities region, or the seven counties by name so that we can start matching them to housing solutions. And then again, we're working on the subregional forums as well as the tax. And in, in many places, what we're finding is that there's already some sort of structure in place that can serve as a subregional form or the TAC. So instead of creating a completely separate kind of parallel work group, we're just going to be working with the local leads and the elected officials to kind of combine and, and make Built for Zero part of this. Um, so this is like, I think what is really, really exciting to me and where we're seeing a lot of hope. Um, this is the number of verified active veterans in our region right now. So right now we have 432 as of June veterans in the seven county Metro Denver region that are experiencing homelessness. And what we see is that third column is the monthly inflow of veterans that are flowing into homelessness. So the number of new veterans identified as experiencing homelessness and then that last column is the outflow. So how many veterans are we resolving homelessness for? How many are being housed? And what we're starting to see consistently is that our outflow is outpacing our inflow, which is exactly what we wanna be doing. And so in green are the months that we've housed more people or resolved homelessness for more veterans than the number of veterans that actually were experiencing homelessness. And I will say um, a little over a year ago, we were in the 800s. And so what we're seeing is a decrease um, very quickly. Um, and in this year alone, during a pandemic, we've seen a 15% decrease in the number of veterans experiencing homelessness, which is really encouraging. And I'm gonna say one caveat to all of that. There's an asterisk next to the 432. And the reason there's an asterisk is Going back to that scorecard, as communities start to go through and figure out where there are gaps, like say they don't have enough outreach in their community and they start to stand up outreach, they're going to start identifying more veterans because they're actually communicating and outreaching to them. So we may see that 432 go up again as we get um, connected with more veterans, but then again, we'll start to see it decrease. And what the goals of this work are Number one is to decrease veteran homelessness by 50% by the end of this year, um, which we're on pace to do. The other goal that I think is really incredibly exciting is for us as a region to end veteran homelessness by the end of 2022. And we would be the first metro region in the entire country to be able to do that. Um, and we think it's actually very possible. Um, again, we're gonna see a slight bump and then we're gonna start seeing it decrease again. Um, kind of um, one of the things that I think this group, you know, particularly wants to see is what's the baseline? How many veterans are on your community's by name list or your county's by name list? So this is currently, we've taken that 432, broken it down and kind of said, okay, 
There are 31 veterans in Adams right now that are connected to Adams resources and probably want to be housed in Adams. So that's the group, the chunk that you all need to start kind of figuring out how to house. Arapaho, that's 28. Boulder, we're still kind of working on that. Um, Broomfield, there will be more than that once you get outreach kind of up and running. Um, Denver, we're pretty confident. There's 295. Jefferson, 42. And Tri-Cities, one. Again, there's some more work to be done there to identify um, veterans and making sure we're, we have full coverage before we're confident in that number. But I think to a lot of communities having like, um, you know, Arapaho knowing there's 28 people they need to house to be able to reach, start getting towards functional zero. I think that feels much more doable than that whole number of 432, which is why we chose to kind of create a sub-regional approach to this. Um, kind of some really significant celebrations that have happened. Um, I will say the last 18 months hasn't been a lot to celebrate, but with the Built Through Zero work, um, there's actually quite a few things that have been significant. We are the first metro region in the country to kind of create this framework where we have a regional response that's really organized around local needs. We have veterans assigned to their communities. We um, are starting to see providers really understand and get excited about this work because they feel like there's light at the end of the tunnel. They're starting to see like, okay, we only need to house 42 veterans in our community. And that gets us to a place where we can actually figure out how to end veteran homelessness. And so they're getting very excited and very um, engaged around this work. We've seen significant decreases. And we're also becoming a national model for regional collaboration and trying to figure out, you know, how do we as a, a very diverse region work together on this, um, this issue? And then kind of lastly, we're not only building an effective response for veterans, but this is a proof point and a learning process for us to be able to really address all subpopulations and all types of homelessness. So I just said a lot of words. So I'm going to pause there and stop sharing um, and kind of answer questions that people might have about this. Jamie, thanks for this information and and uh, for you city county managers on the on the call uh you're the reason that we're having this dialogue today um because way back when when we first started the forums this was something that you put in front of dr Cog right out of the gate so uh we want to keep you apprised of what's going on but i, I think also we want to see if there are any potential ties between the EDA presentation that, that you just had, the work that, that um, is happening with Metro Denver Homeless Initiative and Built for Zero on, on homelessness and, and um, the affordable housing uh, discussion that is ongoing as well. And, and Brad, this might be the perfect time for you to, to make note of what's coming um, through DOLA that, that we're going to be engaged with on, on that front as well. Uh, thanks, Lou. I can just mention this quickly so that if there are questions for the Jamies, we can, we can talk about those as well. But I put it in the chat and I'll add it again in case folks joined late. But um, uh, also sort of ARPA related, uh, House Bill 1271 uh, created three uh, affordable housing programs being run through DOLA, either Division of Housing or Division of Local Government. Um, there is a planning grant program uh, through DOLA that is actually uh, open now. Um, they went ahead and opened it. Uh, those applications are due uh, on September 20th. Um, ultimately, it's about sort of unlocking uh, uh, sort of policy and regulatory strategies to either incent or remove barriers to affordable housing uh, through local government policy, uh, zoning, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and I mentioned it not only because it's an opportunity uh, and the impending deadline of September 20th, um, but the general feeling behind this is that there's something like $6.7 million available uh, statewide uh, that's gonna get spent when it gets spent. Um, there is a September 20th deadline uh, and then DOLA is likely going to do uh, a rolling uh, application so that each month they will see what else has come in uh, the door and if and if eligible uh, uh, communities uh, and eligible projects expend the funds in just a couple of uh, cycles, uh, that would suggest that the, the money has has been uh, obligated to communities around the state to do this important work. And notably, there is a 
grant program that they are currently um, de developing the program guidelines on related to sort of incentives uh, for the development of affordable housing. And for you to be eligible as a local government, you have to have a certain number of strategies in place uh, to unlock sort of those larger uh, grants. I think there's something like $37 million uh, available uh, through the incentives uh, grant program. Um, and because these are ARPA funds, you're looking at kind of a three-year clock uh, to spend uh, the funding. So just mostly want to know, let folks know to be on the lookout uh, for uh, this. I can be a good resource to folks going forward. I've had sort of online and offline conversations with DOLA in terms of how and in what way we can make sure the metro area uh, local governments are engaged uh, and in receipt of information uh, related to this opportunity. So I threw uh, the link uh, to DOLA's website in the chat. I'll do it again just in case uh, folks join late and then obviously feel free uh, to reach out uh, if you notice anything and you want to know a little bit more uh, either about what's known now or what DOLA might be working on uh, over the coming months. So thanks, Flo, for the opportunity to update the group. Okay, thanks, Brad. So are there questions for, for uh, Jamie with Metro Denver Homeless Initiative on the work that they're doing and how things are progressing with the sub-regional forums? I know to some extent, um, some of you have already been engaged with your staff in that conversation. Jamie, from the other Jamie, I'm curious, what are, are there like programs, programmatic needs or funding needs that are priority on your list for, to basically assist the veteran homeless population? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, Jamie. I think it depends on the community. And that's actually, I think, would be like a great segue maybe into the next conversation is around, um, one of the things as we're doing this built for zero work on these sub-regional forums, exactly that question, Jamie, is coming up. So counties, cities are starting to plan with their dollars. Um, but what staff has shared with us, as well as elected officials, as we're out kind of talking to them, is really a desire to understand what other communities are doing so that we're not duplicating efforts. Um, because I think we have a really historic opportunity um, to create some really meaningful long-term lasting impact. And I think there's a lot of will to kind of make sure um, that, you know, one of the allowables is buying motels and converting it into permanent supportive housing. But if we all do that for just the veteran pop population, good news, we'll end veteran homelessness very quickly, but we may have over um, planned for like one population versus being a little bit more strategic and thoughtful. Um, so kind of the ask to MDHI and Flo, are you okay if we kind of transition into the next kind of item on the agenda? Yeah. Okay, great. Is um, talking about getting kind of some feedback, particularly from the managers um, around where spending is potentially going as you're doing some local planning. Um, so again, kind of want to talk through um, this request that um, MDHI has been asked of, of elected officials as well as staff, just to have, kind of have a regional conversation or a regional understanding of what's happening and being able to share that across um, so that we're not all doing the same thing um, and we're being really thoughtful and strategic. So here are some things that um, from the ARPA funding are allowable. I've heard a lot of like things outside of this, which has been really exciting, um, with, particularly around housing, but. Um, production and preservation of affordable housing, tunnel-based rental assistance, supportive services, which is really exciting because generally we don't get a lot of money for supportive services, and then homeless prevention, housing counseling, things like that, as well as the purchase and development of non-congregate shelter, which is really important, um, which can then be kept as shelter or kind of converted into permanent housing which is one of the largest needs in our entire continuum. Our entire region is more housing to meet the needs of people um, either experiencing homelessness or facing housing instability. So if I may, what I'd love to do is a little bit more of an interactive activity um, where if you happen to have a phone or if you wanna pull up in another screen in your laptop, um, if you will go to menti.com, and then enter the code 93722352. Um, and I can also 
drop that in the chat for you. I think it would be helpful to kind of get um, a 30,000 foot view, if you will, on what people are kind of thinking of or planning. Um, and so we are going to do this and I'm going to go ahead and present. Um, so if you don't mind, again, going to menti.com and using the code, oh, I lied, 9902-8521. They changed it on me since I changed the question. Apologies. And what I'd like to do, if I could please, just from all of you, is get maybe um, a visual on what are some ways that your city potentially plans to use the funding on addressing housing or homelessness and security. And you should be able to definitely choose more than one. Um, and just kind of give this a few minutes for people to throw this out there. Flo, are you able to give me an idea, because you know everyone's still on this call, how many city managers um, are still on the call? Um, quite a few. We've got 22 panelist attendees, and the majority of those are city managers. We've got six responses for you right now. OK. So I think the good news, what I'm seeing here so far is that the production or preservation of affordable housing is one of the major priorities for cities, which I think is really exciting, as well as supportive services, um, which hopefully kind of go hand in hand. Um, I'm gonna go I ahead think and- I might go. wanna go with that, Jamie. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next one. Um, it looks like one other person said, or one person said other. So um, if you want to, or if you want to add some information about maybe any details about, this is anonymous, so it won't, um, but just about um, what the other option is, or if there are details you want to share, you should be able to type in and a bubble will come up. I need some Jeopardy music while we're doing this. Okay, you should still be able to finish that. And then I'm gonna go to the next one. Um, I know a lot of you are working on plans. I think one of the, you know, the questions that I'm hearing is, when is everyone anticipating your city finalizing its plan for this funding? And then I think I think what I want to do on this is maybe um, stop the mentee and just have a little bit of a conversation, um, just from the manager's perspective. What would be helpful you, for you to know and kind of coordinate on as your community looks to spend funds, particularly on homelessness and housing, and kind of, um, if you will, pick the brains of this group so that we make sure we can facilitate these conversations regionally. Do you want to call people out or do you want people just to offer? 
just offer would be great. Thank you, John. I would say that it's critically important that we gather our thought and do this collectively more as a region than as independents, as already been mentioned. I think the county has a, a, a real big responsibility and role in coordinating this at a higher level than any one jurisdiction or municipality. And with those thoughts, I would say that um, we can help people better by working at a bigger level than not. We don't have any specific designation or feel of what we can do individually. We're not doing part of like the tri-county initiatives or whatever, but anything that we would do would probably be disparate outside of helping people when they need it, as they need it along the way. So we need a place to refer, to point, to show people a pathway to uh, getting the resources, help they need. And I'll add a very big caveat, if they want help or if they want to go, uh, because a lot don't. Thank you. Thank think, you for that, John. I guess yeah. I think the county has a much bigger role than any one municipality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then Devin, I saw your hand go up. Good to see you again today. Yeah, hi, Jamie. And I was just going <laughs> to kind of follow up. Jamie and I had a meeting this morning with uh, other folks in the Tri-Cities area. And, and one of the discussion points we had along uh, this point was, you know, coordination when you're looking at some uh, fairly large investments, say, with regards to like a navigation center. So um, do we all need to do navigation centers or do we need to kind of coordinate where those go or at least a discussion on those so we're, we're, um, we're maximizing the, uh, the uh, efficiency of those funds. And Devin, can I, can I ask a little bit more? Mm -hmm. and, okay, um, who, so it sounds like John, you're saying the counties need to be at the table. It sounds like the city managers, Devin, is that the level that you feel like is like the ideal to be having these conversations? Um, yeah, I think that's a good level. <laughs> okay. So, um, and, and we have opportunities to, to coordinate with each other on, on a lot of these already. So, you know, for example, in the Tri-Cities with what we're doing right now. So I think that that's a good point. And then you can have the managers bring in folks as necessary. And that's what I'm wondering is if we were to, and I just want to say like, I'm by no means an ARPA funding expert. Um, it's more like, I think MDHI being a convening body. So if we were to bring together county level city managers, um, who would we be missing in those conversations to be able to coordinate on these dollars? I think it just, it'd be maybe some of your, your nonprofits that are okay. engaged in it as well. So, if, you know, here in the Tri-Cities area, it's changed the trend in folks like that, that would need to be with them. That makes sense. Devin, any other thoughts? No, that was the main one that jumped to mind. Yeah, I think that's like what, you know, a lot of people are feeling is just this, they wanna be assured that when we're making investments, particularly large investments that we're not duplicating and we're being thoughtful. Um, so it sounds like city managers, county, and then nonprofits. So Devin, maybe like the community leads that we've identified in the Built for Zero work kind of being in the needs of the, the nonprofit partners. Yeah, because I think a lot of those folks are, are already tied into that, into that group. Okay. Thanks, Devin. Other thoughts from others? Michelle, if you're, if you're um, actively engaged, I'm, I'm curious as to your response to what, you know, John just lined out at, at seeing a county take a lead position on this and 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 Jamie Heckboys, I'm gonna assume that counties can play in the OPA funding game as well. So yeah, I mean I think John and Devin, we we've talked about this, I think, at a, within Arapahoe County about how we can all work together and collaborate. So 
I mean, I think there is a role and, and, but we all have to partner together with our nonprofits and we've been doing a lot of road shows because I think we were on a couple of calls with Jamie and Devin and others <laughs> today, um, but we've been doing a lot of stakeholder outreach around um, ARPA funding and, and desired needs. So, I mean, I think there's a role obviously for us to play, you know, in coordinating homelessness because there is such a, at least in Arapahoe County, there's a, you know, we, we're really long and we're really big and there's a lot of different needs. So, um, you know, we work from Aurora to, to the Tri-Cities. Yeah, and counties on the EDA level can totally definitely apply for EDA funds. I did want to clarify uh, the other Jamie slide of the eligible funding for those ARPA funds are coming from different pots than EDAs. So most likely state or local or other ones. And I am not an expert on, a ED or on all ARPA funding either, really just EDAs because it is such a big bucket. But um, with regards to your discussion with what you all are thinking, um, some thoughts, and I know I share this with Flo via an, an email, if there's any kind of workforce development programs um, to kind of train the homeless population across the region, that could be an EDA project. Um, we usually can't fund, say, shelters, and we can't fund housing, um, but in the, when you are looking at other potentially economic development investments, have in showcasing that the other investments you might be doing with other ARPA funding alongside it, I think would make it competitive competitive because it's you are doing equitable development by bringing that in mind as well as how other potential investments might fund it. Great point. Thanks, Jamie. And then John, I saw your hand go back up and Devin yours as well. When you say training the homeless, the only thing that came to my mind was informing them of what resources are available. Is there something else that you would train them to do? And then what would that be? I don't know if I have that, the answer to that. That's a very good question. Um, and would be interested if, yeah, you've seen um, examples of models for kind of those transitioning out of the homeless population to basically re-entry into the workforce, essentially. Yeah, and it, that's actually what I want to bring up. In, in one of the things that the Tri-City area is looking at, at doing is, is uh, partnering with the program uh, Ready to Work. They operate in Boulder, they operate in Aurora, <clears throat> and they take folks that are homeless, they put them in temporary housing, and they also employ them. And it's through contracts that the, uh, uh, that the folks with Bridge House is the overarching uh, uh, organization on this. Bridge House has contracts um, for different services they do, catering, they do landscaping. Uh, there might be some other things and I'm just not recalling them off the top of my head. Um, and so they have the temporary housing, the job training, and then the other wraparound services that are all part of that um, to take people immediately out of homelessness and start to transition them with that training. And that's where my, my question kind of comes from is that, you know, you said you can't use the funds for the housing aspect of it or, or that type of thing. But this is kind of a program that has the housing, has the, the job training, has all of it wrapped in together as one. So is that something that we could maybe consider looking at doing? Because again, Littleton, Sheridan and, and Inglewood are, are looking at, um, we've already done a feasibility study with, with um, uh, Bridge House and they're looking for facilities in our area. It'd be great if we could tie some funding in with that too. Yeah, that's a perfect qu question, Devin. And it, it, it hits on a piece that I forgot to mention is that yes, one, we could fund the training pieces of it, whether that's personnel space, but the good jobs challenge that I mentioned, the last funding opportunity can fund wraparound services. Okay. Um, th that is the only funding opportunity and it's kind of a new EDA model, um, but it's outlined that we could kind of fund stipends for transport, childcare, um, other, other wraparound services that are eligible within the funding opportunity. Um, but it, and it is specifically looking at building and utilize or building out those kind of training ecosystems uh, for underserved populations um, okay. such as this. So I think that could be a competitive project. Good, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Devin. Thanks, John. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts or input on kind of a regional conversation? Um, it sounds like what I'm hearing is that it might be helpful to bring people together 
to have a, a really targeted conversation just on this topic to figure out what people are doing. Um, and then how we might be able to coordinate where coordination would be beneficial. Flo, I see you nodding. I'm yeah, wondering if people I, can. I, yeah. that, that's kind of what I heard, Jamie. And, and um, I think actually this is a, a perfect segue into the, the next conversation we're gonna have be, because um, I've got uh, Dewanta Parks and, and a lot of the managers on the call may know Dewanta, he's on the CCCMA um, Board of Directors uh, and, and, and working on his MPA, even as we speak. But um, Dewanta is now with uh, the Denver Economic Development Office and they have a workforce development um, program that's specifically targeted at, at uh, underserved populations, um, BIPOC popu populations, very low income populations and, and um, I don't know, Duanta, if that's even going to extend the umbrella to training for the homeless, but, you know, that's, that's a relevant conversation to, to what we're having. And of course, with your background and experience in working with veterans and the homeless population, um, I, I think this next presentation might be kind of interesting for us to consider. So if there aren't any last minute questions or observations for, for Jamie Rice, or for Jamie Hackboyth, uh, I, I think we're gonna transition in, into uh, Duanta's presentation. So Duanta, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Duanta Parks, as uh, Flo was saying. Um, I've definitely spent a number of uh, moments with uh, certain city managers in this forum. First off, I would like to thank Jamie and Jamie for actually talking about the homeless, uh, the veteran homeless piece as a veteran myself. And I've been working with the veteran homeless population for a number of years and we've come up with like several different st uh, strategies. Um, something I wanted to mention too, um, because I was once an employee, uh, employee of uh, the uh, CDLE under the uh, WDP program under the Jobs for uh, State Veterans. Uh, and I'm probably gonna mess it all up. But we've done like a, a lot of different initiatives. And as a matter of fact, we, co we partnered and uh, created a strong collaboration with the Homeless Veteran Reintegration Program, which became like a national model that we created right here in uh, Colorado. So if you, if you wanna, you know, offline have some more conversations about that, or even, some, or even connect you with even some people in Denver, I'll be glad to, to help you with that. Um, but like I said, I'm glad that I got to come after you because believe it or not, as everyone was talking about the training aspects of it, this is kind of where we've been parallel. We've been kind of hitting this scope uh, uh, coming through. So as my presentation goes through, we're gonna talk a lot about some of the uh, construction initiatives that, that Denver's going through and then or that's doing right now. And then some of the pieces that we're looking at. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my um, screen and just let me know if you can see it. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone can see it. I probably need to do this differently. Give me just a minute. And by all means, if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, we're really excited about um, some of the initiatives that Denver is doing right now. And uh, really, I'm really happy to, to share some of this information that we have going on, okay? That's perfect, Dewanta. You've got it. Which screen do you see? I want to make sure I got three screens working right oh, now. We've got the presentation one. Oh, oh yeah. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me put it back on. All right. Screen two. And you see presentation, right? Yep. We've got it. Okay, good. Um, so first off, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the, the Denver Construction Careers Pilot uh, review, um, and this is an initiative that's been started that was kind of kicked off by the mayor, uh, of the mayor of Denver. And, it, and we're still good with everybody seeing it, right? Yep, got okay, it. Okay, good deal. Uh, so for today, we're gonna talk about, uh, you know, uh, some of the stuff as far as the overview of what we do. I'm gonna introduce the team, uh, program overview, background, workforce impact, moving forward, talent pipeline, and then uh, potential uh, partnerships, how can we work together um, for mutual success? 
a lot of things that we've been doing um, since 2019 up until present has been very beneficial for um, surrounding communities because individuals who actually live in those communities come to Denver and work on some of these projects, which are able to take their, to their um, earnings and actually um, put money back into the populations that they're actually living in. So that's, that's something I really wanted to put the emphasis on and stress, stress about. Now, the team members um, who's, who's actually leading, well, let me, let me go ahead and, and start, start, let's see. Okay, I got you, Jamie. Uh, so for the DDO team or the Denver Economic Development, and I, I'm, I always mess up the name, Denver Economic Development Opportunity, Eric Caraga is our executive director, uh, followed by um, Deborah, uh, Deborah Cameron, who's the uh, chief business development officer. We fall directly under um, Tony Anderson, who's workforce services. And then we have Dana Williams, uh, who's assistant um, workforce services, who's leading this uh, ragtag uh, bunch of uh, misfits is uh, Marcus Johnson, who is a project manager. Then we have John, and I'm, I always mess up John's name, so I'm going <laughs> to sit up. John Frondolfer, which he's probably going to beat me up later, so it's, it's fine. Uh, project liaison, myself, uh, Cindy Perry, and then we have Derek Watson. Um, so all of us are really in charge of a lot of these major contract or major construction contracts as it focuses on the workforce uh, workforce piece within the, the contract, okay? Um, so quick program overview. Uh, currently there's uh, 7 billion in metro area, area projects. We have a talent shortage is estimated at 26,000 construction workers needed to complete uh, plan projects by 2026. Areas of need, Denver has uh, many uh, neighborhoods and populations which have not prospered along the rest uh, with the rest of the community. So this was, was a huge initiative, like I said, by the mayor to really put the emphasis on um, providing like assistance, employment assistance, and then really emphasize it on uh, making sure that individuals who are not at the income level have the opportunity to get at the income level on a lot of these projects that we're actually serving. Uh, the purpose of the uh, Denver Construction Careers Pilot is to test and identify uh, best practices for connecting Denver residents to city funding uh, uh, construction projects over a year period of 2019 to 2021 to inform city um, policy. Now, as you can tell, we're running up into 2021. Now this is like we, we collected all our data and said, hey, this is the best way to go about it. Here's where we kind of re make the recommendations. At the same time, we're also trying to find collaboration pieces with uh, um, surrounding communities. So it's not just a Denver focus. And I like what someone said was uh, looking at it from a regional kind of aspect of it, because that's what's going to help us, especially coming out of COVID, that's what's going to help us kind of thrive, right? Um, the city projects uh, construction value, we really don't focus on things that's under 10 million. Um, but if it's something that is that is necessary, we will definitely take a look at it and then include it in some of our, our um, um, plans. Uh, we include workforce development requirements. We build world class uh, program. And some of the things that's actually been initiated has uh, been put in motion by other other states. So there's a whole lot of a lot of things that's happening. We have uh, uh, really strong reporting mechanisms. Um, to make sure that we're on point and on target for the requirements of the construction or the contract that the uh, uh, construction companies have signed with the city. Um, here's some of the current projects that we actually work with that's varying over 10 million. I really wanted to put the emphasis on the 16th Street Mall because that's one of the Dr. Cox kind of uh, projects that we're working on too. Um, but we're all over, like we're all over. There's, there's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm currently leading the uh, Colorado Convention Expansion Center, which is, uh, you know, projected to, to bring billions of dollars worth of revenue coming through. So we have like a lot of things that's happening, um, which why we're trying to really look at uh, creating strong partnerships with uh, communities and surrounding areas and how can we get not just Denver back to work, but how can we get Colorado kind of back to work and really uh, be the powerhouse that we are, are destined to be. Um, so some of the workforce requirements that we have when we're talking to like different um, 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 companies or construction companies, whether it be the primary or the subs, uh, 
really want, and, and this, this kind of ties into where everyone was talking about um, what kind of training does he have for like the homeless population? What, what, how do we do, how do we get them kind of connected? This is kind of where we, we help out and get them connected. Like housing things, we already know that that's, that's a huge um, issue across the nation. And, um, but at least putting things in steps as far as um, obtaining some sense of employment, you know, which will lead to this, which leads to that. It's kind of where we can help out, you know, with supportive services like the individual needs to, uh, I mean, if they need to get an ID or if they need to get uh, boots or if they need to get basic things like these are things that we can kind of point them in, point them in the direction to get the things that they need to. Uh, a lot of the uh, projects that we do work on have a uh, workforce coordinator that focuses on making sure that they have the adequate numbers that we're looking for, right? Now, Primarily on a lot of the projects that we work on, we do kind of focus on target populations. Uh, some, of the, some of our target, target populations that we focus on would be veterans, formerly incarcerated individuals, TANF individuals, history of homelessness, um, history of foster care, graduates of pre-apprenticeship programs. Um, for the 16th Street Mall one, we're just taking out the target areas and then uh, targeted zip code areas and then uh, the formal incarceration piece. But, the reason why I really want to put the emphasis on this here is because there's always a, if, if there's a will, there's a way. We can get people plugged in. And this is, this is where the partnership and collaboration kind of comes in place or when we're trying to work with a lot of uh, communities that surround it, right? Because it's, you, to address the homeless piece, you just can't do it on your own. Um, luckily with the veteran population, there's a ton of different um, avenues and a ton of different ways that you can approach it, just depending on what their, uh, uh, depending on what their discharge is or how long they were in the military or if they have active duty service. So um, some of our, our training strategies, I mean, like right now, as of now, some of our metrics is um, we have it to where 15% of the construction hours um, have to be performed by, performed by registered apprentices, apprentices and then 25% of that 15% hours of total residents in target uh, areas are from target populate or target population and then 25 percent by a first year apprentice right so we really want to get the ones that have uh, the barriers to employment to get them up to a, a part to where they can actually start making and you know, making a, a livable wage especially within Denver or even in surrounding areas um, very strong uh, uh, metrics and strategies to track some of the things that we're trying to do I mean, if we're promoting this to the city, our city council will say, this is what's gonna work, this isn't gonna work. And it's been uh, a ph uh, phenomenal with our outcomes. Um, this is the work impact piece. And I just wanted to, to, to just have everyone take a look at the slide, right? So from 2019, when the, from, from the inception of the program, the average wage of like workers, and we're talking about from the scale of uh, veterans to homeless, to uh, recently, or who, who have background issues, are um, TANF recipients. I mean, the whole bit, everything that I talk about in the target population is, is kind of lumped, uh, lumped into some of these reports. And as you can tell, from close to uh, 5,200 total workers, average salary is going, is going at uh, you know, $30 an hour. You know, and 20, 29% is from Denver. So as you can tell, like it's coming from other communities, which I go back and I'm gonna reiterate like the strong partnership and collaboration with other cities, uh, which is what's gonna make us work uh, great. And then if you see like new, new hires, 28%. So 2019, let's go ahead and go to 2020. You see the increase, right? Um, average, is, average wages is still about the same, but we still have like an increase within the total workers, and then we'll go into today, or we'll go into this year. So as you can see, no matter what, a lot of these, these workers are coming from outside of Denver, which is really good for the, the uh, economy that you're working with, or, or the, the areas that are staying there, right? Um, our talent pipeline, and, and this goes along to where we were talking about uh, how do we get, how do you train, you know, um, individuals who are, are lacking housing uh, options, right? Um, we have created certain certain metrics and, and mechanisms to kind of get them plugged into play. I know that we're 
currently in the talks of looking at doing a, a, uh, a one-stop kind of collaboration piece to get things going, uh, to get things moving, right? Um, so there's a lot of different uh, initiatives and, and ideas that we're doing because we know that the, in Denver, we know like the homeless population is, is pretty huge and we want to make sure we try to attack that as much as possible. Um, but these are some of the, 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 the things that we're looking at from our talent pipeline and then making sure that we're building up for the future uh, construction piece. Because as you can tell, these jobs are, are, are going to get bigger as the, as the years goes on because there are going to be so many requirements and so many hours on the construction projects. So like in Denver Public Schools, a special revenue for uh, support DPS and, and work now. Um, careers and construction um, target for high schools, uh, schools in fall 2021. Um, this is something that is huge for us too, the civilian uh, conservation um, course, summer youth training, um, Denver uh, Mountain uh, Parks, uh, Denver Urban Garden interns, um, local, local universities. We're really trying to come up with a partnerships uh, to make that happen. And then uh, some of the industri industry engagement tech, uh, technical assistance and private projects focused on recruitment for city projects. So like, like I said, we've got like a lot of different initiatives. And this is something where I wanna definitely um, extend this out to everyone on the call, like well, how can we help you out or how can we come up with a different idea to address some of those needs that you might have or that you might, might be having, you know? Uh, because I think that there's a, there's definitely an opportunity to create some form of a best practice of what's already been done. Something that, that has helped us tremendously uh, here in Denver is the relationship that we've actually built with nonprofits, um, local communities, and really dive into um, things to be extremely successful because we can do, like I said, a ton of wraparound services and some of the other things. But the key thing is like, it's, it's a strong partnership that, really, that has helped us become really really successful um so that's pretty much all i have because i know that there's a ton of information i would like to open it up for any questions uh that anyone would like to have and and, and we're and the team is on so we're really really excited to to figure out how we can help you out Well, thanks, Devonta. Can, um, can I just add a, a, a small piece to what you shared with the group? Um, and, and honestly, I'm going to be very selfish in my comments uh, because I am the project liaison for the 16th Street Mall renovation, which is a huge project. And I know uh, Dr. Cog is, is a part of our funding source for, for this work. And a part of my goal is to make sure that, that the, the folks that are engaged in Dr. Cobb have a good sense of what we're doing from a workforce development perspective. Uh, we, we want to provide training for folks as well as long-term sustainable careers in construction. And, and we're using 16th Street Mall as, as a mechanism to really jumpstart a lot of that training and a lot of the, uh, the long-term employment initiatives. So I just wanted to, to reiterate, we have a lot of different projects, but there are some, sort of like what Dante said, uh, some of them are iconic types of projects. And 16th Street Mall is one of those iconic projects that will receive a lot of, of attention. And, and we wanna make sure that our funding partners from Dr. Cobb have all the information they need about what we're doing on workforce. So, I'm, I'm very selfish in, in my comments because I wanna make sure that if someone asks you about, well, what is Dr. Cog doing related to workforce on 16th Street Mall? Well, you, you have somewhere to go. You have an answer at your disposal. And so um, after, after our discussion today, feel free to follow up with any of us on the team about um, workforce development, not just in Denver, but maybe in, in your community as well. I know our focus is Denver, but we have a larger commitment to all of the, the citizens in Colorado. So if you have questions, even if they're not Denver related, feel free to, to bring them to us. Okay, I'll be quiet. Thanks, and, and Thanks Derek, that's, uh, that's a generous, a generous offer. 
so. Um, are there any comments or questions from anyone on the on the call? Okay, uh, Duante and 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 your entire team, because I have met with the entire team and and uh, you guys are great, fantastic, doing really good work. So um, let's think about this from a regional perspective and how you know the region might be able to leverage some of the work that that uh, that, that we're seeing coming out of of Denver Economic Development Office. Line and and. Um, you have any comments? Well, yeah, I would I would like to, I mean, like, like, and, and I'm 1000% on, on what Derek was saying. I, I am a little, this is a little bit of, uh, we want to make sure that we, we get the information to call. Um, but I would, I would like to extend out that even, even as Derek said, we were stewards of Colorado. We want to make sure that we come up with, uh, you know, collaboration or some ideas because what happens around the state is going to have an impact on us, whether it be direct or indirect. We want to make sure that we are in this together, you know. So um, definitely let us know. I mean, I will drop my um, email in the comments. If there, if anyone wants to have sidebar or um, um, just a quick discussion or something too, but we have a lot of jobs and we can out those who are who are um, needing assistance. And Jamie, right, this might be a good conversation for you to have too going forward. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Agreed. I'm happy to make that link. Okay. Um, well, we'd like to move into the final presentation. And, and, and uh, I know I bugged you guys excessively here to participate in our. Um, our, our survey, but uh, Jim Eshelman uh, with with uh, Dr. Cog has been writing heard on on the responses to that. We actually got, um, I think, Jim, what were were twenty three responses in that survey, which is pretty healthy. And and um, so Jim wanted to present to the managers the results of the manager survey about you know the the weekly video chats versus going monthly. And and um, you know some feedback on on our quarterly uh, forums and timing. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jim. You should be able to share your screen and okay. take it from here. All right, hi everybody. Um, I I'm the pollster here at Dr. Cog, and I work in our communications and marketing division. Um, so let me just bring this up. Can everybody see that? Yep, you need to go to presentation mode. Okay, so, um, okay, beautiful. <laughs> um, so over the last week and a half or so, we, we conducted a survey of, of all of you and we got 23 responses. And uh, the things we looked at were the, the video chat, the, the weekly uh, 30 minute video chat, and then also the quarterly managers forum. And so I'll talk about the video chat first. Um, we, uh, we heard loud and clear that you would like to switch from a weekly 30 minute chat to a one hour monthly video chat uh, covering a specific topic each time. Um, we know from, uh, from the survey that the, uh, the one hour video chat has a much greater perceived value uh, than, the, than the current 30 minute video chat. And uh, as you can see here, it's almost almost everyone perceives at least some value from a one hour monthly video chat versus a little less from the 30 minute. And also the preference was definitely for two thirds by a two thirds majority uh, a one hour monthly video chat. Um, there were some other suggestions and some of those were the need for both uh, spontaneous discussion and specific topics or discussion of a specific topic followed by open discussion. And, and we had a couple of comments where you're just too busy for either type. Um, some suggestions uh, for improvement were to send the agendas and topics in advance. Um, 
a separate group for small governments and to align the topics with the key uh, Dr. Cog board topics. Um, as far as times for the uh, the one hour monthly video chat, uh, the top rank, the top three ranked were Thursdays and early morning, Wednesday, early morning, Wednesday, early afternoon. So, and then Thursday, the fourth was Thursday, early afternoon. So we can see a preference definitely for Wednesday or Thursday and probably early morning for the, for the meeting. Um, some topic preferences, uh, when we just uh, put out some suggestions, 84% of the respondents or most of the respondents said they won't, they would like the what the new normal looks like for cities as a perspective topic. And then also legacy infrastructure and end of life cycle replacement plans. And then it, it drops down from there for some of the other topics, budgeting or windfall funding uh, and so forth. And then we also asked just an open-ended question just to get, um, and this was actually asked before this question, just to get some, um, some ideas of what you might like to see just from, from your original thoughts um, transportation uh, came out very frequently. So did Dr. Cog activities and resources. Affordable housing was was off mentioned often. Homelessness, uh, regional cooperation, and COVID response, and then on down grants, legislation, emergency shelters, and preparedness. Um, and the managers forum. We also asked some questions regarding the managers forum. Uh, <clears throat> One thing that really stood out is the quarterly managers forum has the highest perceived value compared to what we were proposing for a one hour monthly video chat and also the current 30 minute uh, weekly video chat. As you can see from, from the chart here, uh, the managers forum is in blue and uh, it's roughly 94% uh, saw at least some value from that uh, versus, not, versus a little bit less for some of the other the two others. Um, the preferred times for the monthly forum, Thursday late morning or Wednesday early afternoon. Uh, Thursday late morning was the majority and then, uh, and then the other three were, and the next two down were equal and then less preference for Wednesday late morning. Um, what can Dr. Cog do to improve the manager's forum? Uh, one thing that was uh, really mentioned a lot was return to in-person meetings. So the interaction, person interaction is valued. Uh, allow more time for open discussion. Uh, topics of true common interest. Um, and then consider meaty policy issues with panel. Multiple, in other words, multiple, multiple perspectives on the same issue versus um, multiple topics. Um, so delving into one issue in depth. Um, and so that is what we found and I'll entertain any questions. Thanks, Jane, uh, Jim, are there any questions, any comments from the managers that are still on the call, there's a couple of you. <laughs> we don't have many left, do we? <laughs> no. We've got a few diehards. We've got Heather and Michelle and Brian. That's right. And, and welcome to Brian. He's the new guy. He's he's the <laughs> county manager up in Clear Creek County. And, and uh, oh, that's right. I had the pleasure of, of, of having lunch with, with Brian uh, last week, I think. So, um, you know, welcome to Brian. Oh, Devin's still on the line, too. So. Um, no, no. Welcome, Brian. Looking forward to meeting you, sir. Good to be here. Good to be here. Boy. Hey, listen, seeing we're at it, um, Heather Balser, you, I see Heather's still here. Yep. You know, how are you? Fine, thanks. I know you're, you're a short timer now. Yep. <laughs> Can't believe you're one of the first people I met when uh, when I came to Dr. Cog seven and a half years ago. We had lunch up in Louisville, actually, right, right. or breakfast up in Louisville, and uh, so I so I know, um, yeah, I, I I don't know when your last day is. It's August twenty seventh. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Gee whiz. Uh, 
Well, yeah. we're going to miss you, Heather. Well, thanks. I'll miss you guys too, but I'll be around. No worries. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay. So, you know, there's, there, there, there's just a handful, you know, maybe what we can do is, is start uh, a conversation, um, an email chat. Uh, I'll send all of the presentations from today, but also within the communication, talk about the findings of, of our survey. Um, what we plan going forward, um, I, I will send a cancellation notice for the um, weekly video chats to take that off of your, your calendars. And, and uh, then both internal conversations and then conversations with, with, uh, with you managers about you know, what's, what's gonna work best for you. And, and um, I, I, we heard loud and clear the uh, wanna go back to in-person meetings. It's something that um, we'll have to discuss, but you know, another option that got tossed out there was in, instead of always having them at Dr. Cog was to have them around the region. And, and you know, one idea then is to pick a meeting host and, and uh, for the host, or it could be a group of hosts, um, you know, we could have it at the county level host or some variation on that. And, and, and have them choose the topics and, and put the, the presentations and the panel together. And, and of course, we'll you know, backstop that and we'll provide assistance in getting that organized. But there are lots of, lots of options that, that we could think about going forward with, with the manager's forums. But, but we did hear the in-person. Um, and, and, and so that's, that's a point we'll have to discuss. Doug, I don't know if you have any observations on that, but. No, I, I, I like the idea. Yeah, if there are um, communities that would, would like to host, um, we'd be, you know, that, that's something we'd be happy to assist with and we can still provide food and everything too. Yeah, so, so the, the, uh, the hosting responsibilities would really be topic of discussion and, 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 and that type of thing. And, and that way we might get a little closer to, to um, what's, what's a burning agenda item. So um, I don't know if anybody has any other announcements uh, that, are, that are still on. Jayla, I know you're on the call. Brad, we covered your topic. And, and um, welcome to Alec Williams, um, who's, who's one of our new communications and marketing uh, staff members at Dr. Cog. He wanted to join to kind of get a flavor, but Heather, we're gonna miss you. Brian, I enjoyed getting to know you. I'm looking forward to working with you going forward. So, Jayla, if you don't have anything to say, you want, might want to say hi to Brian and bye to Heather. <laughs> well, that's all that's on the line. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'm the director of the Area Agency on Aging at Dr. Cog. So, uh, Brian, I would love to uh, talk with you. Uh, I know that you weren't, um, Gilpin and Clear Creek weren't included in some of our discussions, but I know there are some homeless veterans in your area. I've been in contact with them and uh, uh, trying to figure out some resources for them as well. So I, I would love to, probably not in the next couple of months, because it's crazy, as I'm, I'm sure you're feeling too, as uh, COVID gears back up again for a lot of us in the Area Agency on Aging. It's, uh, it's a stressful time again. Um, for sure. But uh, I would love to set up a meeting with you and talk with you about the older adults that live in your community. That'd be great. All right, Flo, okay, let's so put I a bow on this. Yeah. Yep, I think we're at the end of this. Thanks so much. Take care. Thanks, guys. Heather. Good, Thanks. good talking to you. You too. Bye bye. All right. Brian, bye, good guys. seeing you too. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Flo. <laughs>